Okay, everybody, thank you and good evening and welcome to this episode of the Miriam Institute podcast. We very much appreciate all of you for being here, whether you're listening to us on Zoom or on Facebook Live, or indeed if you're listening to the postcast by way of our podcast or on YouTube, welcome, welcome one and all. And before I get going and start to introduce our guest today, uh, Dr. Nachman Shai, I would like to express my profound thanks to a couple of individuals. First of all, Rosita Panini, who typically would be here, uh, lives in a part of New York that was hit pretty severely by a storm today. So she's not dialing in, but Rosita, thank you as always for all of the work you do to ensure that these conversations take place. They're important conversations, especially at these times. And I also want to thank my great and powerful colleague, Alan Langer, who now is stronger than a storm. Alan Langer, unfortunately, is in a place where a tree came crashing down on the car of him and of his parents, two separate cars, nobody was in the cars, but as it did so, it knocked out the power lines to his home and he is nonetheless able to bring about this webinar. So thank you to Alan and of course to our colleague, Thomas. Thomas, thank you so very much for running this webinar. Uh, so before I launch into the first question, I just want to say that it's possible my camera will go in and out a little bit because this area in New York has also been hit, but I'm still here in the case of a catastrophic connection, we'll adjust. But as I say, we've got with us a wonderful guest, somebody who's really a friend of our organization, and his name is Dr. Nachman Shai, and he is a former member of Knesset, where he served from 2009 to 2019 as a member of the Labour Party. Prior to that, Dr. Shai served as Senior Vice President and Director General in the Israel Bureau of the UJC, the Federations of North America. He also held the position of chair, as, of chair of the Israel Broadcasting Authority from 1999 to 2000. Dr. Shai was the Director General of the Ministry of Science, Culture and Sport. He concluded his military career in the Israel Defense Forces at the rank of Brigadier General, a career that culminated in his service as spokesperson for the Israel Defense Forces. Dr. Shai earned his PhD in political science and communications from Bar Ilan University. He was associate researcher at the John Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics and Public Policy at the Harvard University John F. Kennedy School of Government. And he's a, he, well, I'm going to ask him about this actually in the warm up. It says on the most recent bio, he's a visiting lecturer at the Institute for the Study of Modern Israel at Emory University in Atlanta, but actually, Dr. Shai is absolutely on the move. Dr. Shai, welcome to the webinar. Thank you for being with us. And where are you dialing in from, please, Dr. Shai? I know that you're between Emory and your next destination. Tell us a bit about where you are and when you're, where you're on the way to. You know, I was on my way. I, I landed in uh, Durham, uh, literally on, on, on two days ago. And uh, I'm going to served this coming academic year as a visiting professor at uh, Duke University, and I enjoy um, Durham already. Uh, and I'm uh, looking forward, A, for, uh, to this conversation, and secondly, for an exciting year. And thank you for the storm. We actually delivered the storm. The storm has passed here, and we passed it over to you, and now it's your business, no longer of the Carolinas. <laughs> Carolinas are safe now. Well, it's wonderful. And I'm so pleased that you're continuing to educate people about the states of Israel. So you went from Atlanta, uh, from Emory University, and now you're, in, you're on your way to Duke University. What will you be teaching at Duke, please? Right. I'll, I'll be teaching um, two courses, one of them on uh, Israel's public diplomacy, something that we, in a way, are doing now, and the other one on, on nation building, how Israel had built itself to become a state, history, present, and, and future. Wonderful. Well, I wish you every possible success. Thank you. So I, I, I want to begin by asking you a, a question. The, the title of the talk is Coalition Opportunities. So I'm, I'm going to start with a little bit of a conversation about what it takes to build a coalition. Now, if you were to look for the last bastion of civility in the modern world, I don't think that one would look to the seats of uh, elected office. It seems to become to be becoming a very an increasingly vicious and cutthroat world 
that seems to have taken its eye off the ball of service and achieving a particular objective and rather is weighed down with politicking. It, when you start to teach uh, this coming semester at Duke University, if a young individual should say to you they're thinking about politics but it seems so very ugly, would you encourage them or dissuade them from participating in the political arena? I will, I will encourage them uh, here and I will encourage them in Israel uh, because I believe that the young generation should get involved in, in politics. I'm familiar with all the, really, well, all the aspects of politics. It's not um, a nice world. Uh, and sometimes uh, it, it looks bad and it's really bad. But at the same time, politicians run our world and our states and our democracies. There's no democracy without politicians. I, I don't know what the political system which may work, which one I, I agree with. And uh, so uh, that was what I was trying to do as, as a member of Knesset in Israel, uh, to convince young Israelis that even if it smells bad uh, and it doesn't look good, uh, this, is, this is something they have to do if they care for the future of the state of Israel. Uh, we do have quite a number of young people and uh, Hopefully you will touch that point that the demonstrations now are being held in Israel uh, frequently, two, three times a week. And they are carried out by young people. It's not unfortunately, or fortunately my generation. My generation is sometimes tired, sometimes slow. Uh, they come and sit and watch, but they are not able to walk for hours in the streets and they are not able to carry the flag. And this is something which I don't take any position now. The very fact that young Israelis now are ready to go out and demonstrate and participate in, in this uh, public process is very encouraging. So let, let's actually ask a quick question about that and then I'll come to the current coalition. You, you spoke about the demonstrations. Yes. Now, and, you, and you spoke about that in the context of the young people who want to engage in the public square and the public discourse and even public leadership. Now, there was a lady who moved into the, into the highest or, or, or very prominent positions within the Knesset named Stav Shafir. She, mm -hmm. you'll remember, was somebody who came to prominence by way of protests about social justice and the cost right. of living and so on. Is there, I do not see, however, that in the context of these particular protests that anybody whatsoever is leading, is shooting to prominence, is taking the role of defining exactly what people are protesting for. Why is that? Why is that absent? Uh, two, two things. First of all, Stav Shafir was a member of uh, the Labour Party, but I would generally say that she was running too fast. Let me tell you something. Uh, bear with me. It's a, it's a story from... 30, 40, 30, 40 years ago, uh, the young generation of the Labour Party, which was the leading one in Israel for many, many years, uh, they turned to uh, uh, the old guys, uh, not only Ben Gurion, but then Golda Meir and uh, Sapir and others. And they said, what about us? What, when is what about us? I mean, we are coming in. We are not uh, no longer 30, 40, or almost 50. We passed 50. When? So Golda said, oh, don't push too hard. It will come one day. <laughs> okay, so uh, it didn't work that well. And you know what was the outcome? The Labour, Ball power, the Labour Party ousted after the Yom Kippur War. And this chapter is over and it has never recovered. And as you know, it literally doesn't exist now. There's no Labour Party any longer. Now, I turn to the today, as today as protest. Stav Shafir was a member of the Labour Party, but she um, was pushing, in this case, she was running too fast. She wasn't able to wait, and she lost her seat in the Knesset. But I can assure you, the others. Stav Shafir was the hero, one of the heroes, but another hero of the 2011 uh, the, uh, public protest is Itzik Shmuli. And he's mm -hmm. currently a member of the coalition on the Labour Party, the non-existing Labour Party, but he's a member of the coalition, which is a key position. And he, this, is a, this is someone that did rise out of the, uh, of the protest. So I expect that more young 
or middle-aged Israelis will come out of this. But by the way, you should be aware, and our audience as well, this is not a protest of one or one not even of this a scores of different organizations representing a variety of Israelis from all sectors, for all venues of the Israeli society that came together, which is unique. And there is no one single leader so far. And I'm not sure there will be. That's what makes it very special, very unique, very Israeli, because everyone is a leader in Israel, as you know. So there's not one single leader, because as you said, people have come to these protests by way of different causes. Mm -hmm. Is there one particular thing that is being protested against? What is it, who is it, and why? They want Netanyahu to step, to step down. The 99% the of them, it wasn't at the beginning. At the beginning, some of them said, this is a political protest. Uh, we just want to make sure that uh, our business will, will recover, that life will be recovered, that we need uh, to, uh, to, to break the lockdown and, and get out of business, so on and so on. This was very much uh, business motivated, no longer. Their, their seats there were taken by um, much more aggressive young Israelis, and the common cause is Bibi go home. That's it. And they have their own reasons, as you know, and our audience know as well. That they know why, but Bibi doesn't go home. So, so again, I'm going to come to the coalition in a moment, but how is it, that, what exactly is it that you would say, because Netanyahu has always been a bit of a polarizing figure in the state of Israel, right? He's enjoyed a great deal of, of, of polarized support beyond the states of Israel as well. But within Israel, he's always had a specific group that supported him through thick and thin, a base, if you like. And then he's had others who may not be the biggest fan of, fans of his, but certainly are able to acknowledge his achievements, his political achievements, his policy achievements. Where have all, what has he done to make so many of those seemingly disappear and in their place to find himself facing down out and out opponents from across various political sectors, from across various socioeconomic strata, all saying what you're saying, which is, we want Netanyahu to go, those who are protesting. As you said, uh, um, there are many who like Netanyahu and many who doesn't like him, many who wants him to stay in power and many who wants him to retire or resign. The answer lies in the Jerusalem court, which is going to convene in this coming December three times a week. And the major uh, person to appear in this court, whose name is Benjamin Netanyahu. This trial starts in December, three days a week. This is, this is the reason. The reason that brought him to this trial are the reasons that motivate the people in the streets to ask for his uh, resignation. Uh, they believe that someone, anyone, who is uh, indicted for fraud, uh, for breaching the confidence between the Israeli people and him, the state of Israel and him. And there is a line of, you know, of files here that will be discussed in court, allegations that we call them files, but these are allegations that will be discussed in court. They believe that the person in this situation cannot serve any longer as the prime minister of the state of Israel. Let him run his trial and let someone else run the country at the same time. Maybe, maybe from the Likud, maybe from the right wing. I'm not saying this is all a question of right and left. It's mainly the question whether someone who is so deeply involved and going to be much deeper involved in the upcoming trial because the, just, the, just, the, justice, the, 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 the judges has already, have already made it clear. The chief judge said, she, it's a lady, she said, I'd like Netanyahu to be in court every day. He's not going to be exempted. He's going to be there three days a week. Someone, I mean, it's not a technological, it's a proper technical issue whether he has the time to run the state of Israel, which is not very simple, and at the same time to be in court. It's a question of the, whether he has the moral uh, uh, 
ob ability, the, 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 the moral obligation to the, the, the state of Israel to, to serve as prime minister while to, serve, to, to, to face his trial in court at the same time. That's a very, this is, the, this is a moral uh, dilemma. And their answer is very clear. You can't do it at the same time. So those who are protesting feel that the moral cloud hanging over him is just too much. It's not, it's not in other words, the, the logistical cloud. Can you divide your time effectively? First of all, I don't believe he can, but, but mm -hmm. yes. I mean, and every issue, you should understand, Benjamin, every issue which is now on the agenda, starting with the explosion in Beirut tonight, or a few days ago in Syria, I mean, military action around the country, people implicitly will say, you know, maybe because he's involved in this trial, maybe his hand is uh, a little bit softer when it comes to military operation. Maybe he is interested in something which divert the public attention from what's going on inside Israel to what's going on around Israel. We can't afford it. We believe that the prime minister and the government uh, should handle the state only according to the best interest of the state of Israel and the people of Israel. That's it. That's the only one. And in this case, there's no doubt there are conflicting interests, personal ones, when it comes to Netanyahu. Somehow, it, if you were in, the, in his place, would, wouldn't you ask yourself once a day at least how it, this will impact my trial? These are human beings. We are all human beings. It should be somewhere in his mind. And I'm sure it, it has to be around somewhere during the decision-making process on any given... As you, Israel has just been given six billion shekels to its citizens, to the people of Israel, uh, which, is, which is nice. But the, the economy of, of, is, is Israel... Mm, most of them, all, all, all of them said, this is a wrong step. This shouldn't be done. You don't give money free. You have to make sure that it will go to the right people, those who need it most, or maybe to run the economy, to, to, to stimulate the economy, there are many other, but not just says, uh, deposit money in their bank accounts. That doesn't work. A month from now, the need for money will come again. I mean, how long will it hold? Of course. So we, we, need, we need a plan economic plan, how to save the Israeli, how to survive in this new situation. So they blame Netanyahu that he's done it just to peace the people of Israel, to peace the people of Israel in this situation. Whether it's right or wrong, I leave it for you to decide. But this is around, this is in the air all the time. And that's what makes him, makes his, his, his running the state now by him, running the state, impossible in my eyes, in my view. So, so we, go, we go to now the other component in the coalition. You know, just a couple of moments ago, you said politics can stink and it can smell and, and all these wonderful adjectives and, and so on. The reality of the matter is that the other side, the other major player in the coalition is, of course, Benny Gantz. And Benny Gantz is a perfect example of this. You know, he was chief of staff. And I think when you're chief of the staff in the Israel Defense Forces, you're, you're as close as Israel has to royalty, in a sense. Everybody loves you. You're venerated. You're, you're, you're supported and you're celebrated. And, and you have wonderful deeds and status. And then you jump into the political pool and all of a sudden you're an amateur and you don't know and you're not and you're not strategic and you're not tactical and everything's a total disaster and he has been shot to prominence and he doesn't have trials hanging over his head and he is in my judgment but I want to hear your view he seems to be utterly failing to capture the imagination of the electorate and of the voter what would you say is Benny Gantz's position now because the reason I ask is the demonstrators are demonstrating, and you've said that they're demonstrating against Netanyahu, but they're not saying BB out, Gantz in. They're just saying BB out. So what's, what's Gantz's situation in the eyes of the electorate now? Well, uh, Gantz, a former um, chief of staff, army general, uh, was taken almost from his quiet life uh, to become the leader of the Blue and White party. His political record was empty, nothing, 
but he has his military background. Uh, he didn't do very well in business, by the way. It's, a, it's an issue with him, uh, a separate one under police investigation or something also, which, you know, the Likud is trying to blow very hard, but okay. It's, it's not equivalent to what uh, Netanyahu is being indicted for. Uh, he, he has no uh, any experience uh, in uh, public affairs, no in, in foreign affairs. Uh, but, but he was mm -hmm. able uh, through the a very good organization of uh, Yeshatid Party, which is the then the the the, the, the center the, the the of the of this of blue and white, which has been around for a while. I mean Yeshatid, and they uh, were able to mobilize and recruit two former chief, but not only Gantz but uh, Gabi Ashkenazi, a number of uh, new uh, comers to politics. There's always a belief that the newcomers are better than the old ones. It doesn't work like that. I mean, right. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I see it on my behalf, but because I'm no longer in the Knesset, but it doesn't work automatically. Not every new face someone who you haven't heard of is better than the one you know. I actually, I just the opposite. These people you know already. The other ones, okay, right. leave it open. So, so he's one of them. I mean. And I can compare it again. Uh, I hope that our audience is made of uh, people all ages. So I can compare it to Igal Yadin, who was also the late Igal Yadin, who was also ch ch chief of staff, yeah. professor, famous archaeologist. And he, he uh, was also chosen somehow in 1977 or a year before to lead a party by the name Dash, the, the New Democratic uh, Movement. Uh, he had no political background and so on, and it became a big disappointment for his followers after a very short time. The New Democratic Movement for Change didn't hold for a very long time, and by the way, most of the centrist parties in Israel dismantle, disappear, and new ones are coming and lace them. So being a military or even chief of staff does not qualify you to become prime minister or even a government minister. Let's make it clear. After 74 years, I can say it for, in, 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 in a very uh, high degree of certainty. It doesn't make any difference if you are an army general, university professor, or a public figure who, you know, came out from different activities. Uh, it depends very much on your personal qualifications. Yes, there is a lot of respect in Israel to army generals. That's fine. And it helps very much. But when they finally serve as in those key civilian political uh, positions, you realize that they lack a lot. They don't have the, this public uh, attachment. They don't know the public very well. They don't know the civilians very well. They don't know the, the, how to communicate. I mean, there were some exceptions. Rabin was an exception. Sharon was an exception. Barak, ah, maybe here and there. But if you look at it in a wider perspective, but Ehud Olmert didn't have a military background, and Yitzhak Shamir didn't have a military background, and Levi Eshkol didn't have a military background, and so on and so forth, so Sharet and others. So, so it helps. But there's a point when you ask yourself whether they are able to serve as prime minister. We don't know yet enough about guns, but let me tell you, the major decision he made to join the coalition broke his party immediately into two pieces, equal size. Now the other piece is bigger than his. Right. He lost right. in the public eyes and the public uh, polls, now there are once in a while polls in Israel, uh, uh, at least 50% of his political power so far uh, and uh, I don't know what his future, because it's quite clear that those who supported him to, be, to lead the party and to be a future prime minister, at least 50% of them left uh, blue and white, and now they are supporting the other party, Yeshat, the other half of what was blue and white. That's what the Yair Lapid's party. Yeah, that's the Yair Lapid party. Mm -hmm. Yair Lapid is, is, is not an army general. I think he was not, it was a private, it was a soldier in the army, that's, that's all. He has his other achievements in life. 
Uh, so that's a major question. Why do I raise it? Because there is another army, former army general by the name Gadi Aikot. Yes. I mean, you, we produce enough fast former IDF <laughs> chiefs of staff to supply, to provide the, the need, you know? The, it's a question of right. supply. We don't supply them so fast. I mean, Gadi Eisenkot is the outgoing one. He's been there two years ago. And he's now also warming up, as we say on the line. He's waiting for his turn to come. And I say, guys, wait a little bit. Let them live for a while a kind of civilian life. Chapter, new chapter in their life. And let's see how they are doing. How they are doing in other kind of life. Being a military is you are educated, you are used to a certain kind of running a radical organization. You give orders, people obey. You don't have to argue with them and they don't argue with you. You don't have to persuade them. Usually, I mean, it should be reasonable, but you don't have to persuade them. That's it. This is at the end of the day or the end of the discussion, this is an order, you're gonna do it. In life, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. You have to, dis that's what has been going even now in Israel. You deal with Israelis. Have you noticed what happened to the Israelis now with the coronavirus? Of course. They don't accept the army's, po the, the state policy any longer. They do what they want. That's Israel. Don't forget, it's Israel. It's true about Because America. everybody was a soldier. Yeah, they weren't soldiers, but now they don't feel like they're in the military and they have questions. And uh, they, they, it doesn't work like that any longer. Bibi understand that very well. You can't tell the Israelis what to do. You have to convince them what to do. I had my own experience. I can tell you how it worked at the time. So, so you have this situation with Benny Gantz, and I remember that you said in a previous conversation we had here at the Miriam Institute that you feel Benny Gantz, not Benny Gantz, but, but generals are political babies. They're political babies. And, and I think I, I think want to repeat on this expression, expression sorry. But pardon me? I, I, I'm, I'm, I apologize that I did not repeat on this expression, which I like very much. I, well, it, it actually, I did receive a number of emails about that. And I, and I think that it seems to be proving true. He se certainly seems to be a novice politically, but he's also got, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the budget and the future of the coalition and, and, and opportunities there. But he's also got this flagship position, Nachman, which is, especially in the States of Israel, he is the uh, defense minister. And yes. the defense minister, you know, you alluded to this just a moment ago. You've got the, the event that took place uh, today in, inside Lebanon. You've right. got the, the, uh, the infiltration on the border with Syria. You've obviously got Iran. You've got every, everything that you want to talk about as a defense minister. That should be something that he is able to promote himself, not in a cynical way, but by, by way of deeds and build prominence and build impact and build influence. And he doesn't seem to be doing it. Why? What's holding him back? No, no, that, no, no, that's too early to judge. That's too early. I agree with you that the Ministry of Defense is, can serve as a launching pad for prime ministership. Mm -hmm. I used to work with Yitzhak Rabin at the time, as his, when, he, when he returned to politics after uh, he, he lost the prime ministership in a certain situation. He came back after a few years and he started as a defense minister in a rotation government, in national unity government. He was, and, and from there, he returned to the top of the pyramid. Okay, so, so that may be the case. So let him see how, let, let's see how it works. Omnam, yet my, his title now is alternate, alternate Prime Minister, but we really don't know what it means. What does it mean, Alternate Prime Minister? First of all, uh, and most of all, the Defense Minister of Israel. Let's see how it works for not three, four months, for a year or two, even longer. Then you able to build yourself into the next position. As a, as a defense minister, which is number two in the hierarchy, uh, and potentially is going to be prime minister next year, at the end of next year, I mean, if it works. Uh, this, is, this is an opportunity now for him to prove himself. I guess that's what crosses his mind every morning when he wakes up. He said, okay, I'm building now myself for the next position. Maybe in the public eyes, maybe in, the, uh, in the, his, his personal prestige, 
will uh, return as a defense minister, which usually is very popular in Israel, and then it can, it can help him to, re, to, to gain, not to regain the prime ministership, but it's a process. Let's wait and see. For the time being, a baby. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's one other individual before I turn to the, to the actual workings of the coalition that I want to talk about, because that, there, were, there were these three chiefs of staff and a journalist. There was Boggy Alon, there was mm. Benny wow, Gantz. I forgot, I forgot about him. You're right? Yes. Right? So that, that, that says something. Generals. Around. The generals. Right? Yeah. right? And, then, and then, of course, there's Gabi Ashkenazi. And then you had Yael Lapid. And this group came together and formed the Kahol, cockpit. This Kahol, the, cockpit. the cockpit, as they called yeah. themselves. Now, there's another guy there who was also a chief of staff who Benny Gantz pulled into the coalition with him. And I mentioned him. It's Gabi Ashkenazi. And he is now foreign minister. And he... Right. He seems to be the embodiment of what you said. He seems to be keeping his head down, going about his work, not really feeling any particular pressure to make any particular impact. What's the situation with Gabi Ashkenazi? Is he, is he looking for a moment to usurp Benny Gantz within that party, or is he really learning the tricks of the trade and then seeking higher office? It's a, it's a good question, and I don't know if anyone has the answer. Yes, you're right that he gives all the credit uh, to Gantz, who, by the way, uh, Gabi was Gantz's commander. Right. And not the other way around. But in right. politics, you see, it doesn't work like that. So Gantz is number one and, 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 and Gabi Ashkenazi number two. He chose to be foreign minister. I'm not sure he has all the qualifications for, but... He can if he learns the job. I mean, I'm not saying no one is born as a defense minister, foreign minister, or prime minister. It takes time, and you adjust to that. So I think that Gabi is working hard, as far as I see, and you rightly said that. And he's building, again, himself from this uh, portfolio, which is not easy, because most of the Israelis are not interested in foreign affairs, and sometimes they don't care who is the foreign minister. They're focused on their own business internally, as it is. Uh, Kissinger once said that Israel has no foreign policy, just domestic one. That's, that was his expression after 73. That's how he felt. Whatever Israel is doing tends to be inside and not outside the country. But back to Gabi. Uh, I don't know. Gabi was a major power in driving Yesh, at, yeah, blue and white into the coalition. Gabi was, in, was very much uh, involved in the negotiation. Mm -hmm. uh, and he convinced Gantz at the end of the day to join, even if he was losing half of his previous party. He said, okay, it's worthwhile. We are in the coalition. You are the defense minister. You'll be prime minister. I'll be foreign minister. Then I'll be defense minister. He's going to replace Gantz a year and a half from now as a defense minister. Uh, let's do it. Whether he's going to push him aside and become number one, it's too early to judge. And let me tell you, there are some issues in his past. I don't really know how deeply the, our audience is involved in Israeli politics or in, as a whole, but there is a question of something, the Harpaz letter, which was um, still in question what happened there. Uh, and Gabi was ma managed to get out of it. But when, if, when it comes to the time, I, I assure you that we'll, this file will be reopened and we learn a lot of things about him and other and some again some business of uh, business failures uh, that uh, he should explain what was really going on so I I'm I'm absolutely sure that he a will wait for a while and secondly I'm not sure he would love to jump to jump into the to this uh, ready to uh, and he even said the other day that if, if uh, uh, Eisenkot, the, the other former chief of staff, would like to join, he will give him the, the place to lead the party, which Gantz didn't like very much. Uh, so it's not changing the, the horses between the, the leading horses between them. The question is a little bit different. What is blue and white? It's not a party. Likud is a party. Yeah, Labour was a party. Party is not just names and people. Party is a certain ideology. 
Mm. Organization is fine. But what is the ideology of blue and white? Kill me and I won't know what is the answer. You can kill me. I don't know. And I've been asking that question. To be, you know, to be fine, that everything will be okay, is not an ideology. It's not a way. It's like daily business. I'd like my business to succeed. Okay, we understand. But what's the future of the business? Where are you taking the people to? What do you vision to be Israel's future 20, 50, 100 years from now? I don't know what the blue and white has to say about it. And I've been asking and asking. Labor had. Labor mm -hmm. had a certain ideology, yeah. but labor is not around. And maybe in the future, blue and white will turn labor, but it doesn't work like that. So, so what uh, blue and white lacks very much, they, they were very much based on their success on thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that were looking for a change in power, Bibi should go, as, as, as we just discussed on, on, a, on another content. That's what they wanted. And they didn't ask too many questions because if had they asked the question, they wouldn't be given the answers. Blue and white has no idea. Yes, Shatid, it's a little bit clearer, but still it's, a, it's in the center. It's bringing someone from the right and some, other, some people from right and left and so on, and to have a kind of a mix. It doesn't work in politics. There's a right and left that are two different basic ideologies. And for the time being, at least 60% of the Israelis are on the right. I believe they're wrong, but they are on the right. And they are right political side. And, 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 and they are the, the majority within, at least within the Jewish community or the Jewish population in Israel. I, I don't count in this context the Arab population. Of course, they are legitimate Israeli citizen, they have their own party or parties now, and they are players, and legitimate players in the political game. But if I just look at the, the, the Jews living in it, like 7 million people, 60% of them at least are the right, in the right side of the political game. So th there's so much there. I'm, I'm going to move on to, to the issue of the, of the budget. So okay. within 100 days, you have to fix a budget, uh, you have to pass a budget, Benny Gantz. One of the things you made mention of the fact that the policy of blue and white is not particularly clear, Gantz's party. But I remember during the the elections, they were very forthright about what they called the Tochnit Ravshnatit, a multi-year plan on so many issues, on education and on the budget and 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 transport and security and so forth. And they are now pushing very vigorously for a two-year budget to be passed, right? And Netanyahu is pushing for a one-year budget to be passed. And if they continue at this impasse, there's going to be a real crisis for the coalition to the point where the coalition could actually completely crumble and fall apart. First of all, just explain that to us. What's the source? What's each each uh, person putting forward as their reason for going for one year or two years and secondly just explain to us what might be the ramifications if they don't if no one compromises and if they end up locking horns and, and indeed do not reach some sort of a consensus okay so the the the, the question is whether israel is going to have one year budget or two years budget. but there's no one year uh only three months or four months, three months. Uh, for, for the end, until the end of the year. So four year budget is ridiculous. Uh, and uh, Netanyahu is pushing and pressing very much for- a Four months budget, you mean, yeah? Uh, four no. months budget, no. while uh, Gantz says that according to the coalition agreement signed between the two uh, major parties, Likud and Blue and White, he, uh, the budget should be for at least two years. There's no two, there are no two years, it's only a year and a half. What makes it so funny, at least to me, is that when I was still at, in the Knesset, which is not long time ago, uh, I met you when I was still in the Knesset, like a year and a half ago, the coalition led by Netanyahu passed two year budget. And then we tried to convince them, we were in the opposition, Mm -hmm. uh, that one-year budget is the right way to go because with right one-year budget you can still uh, react to whatever is going around you. Coronavirus. Well, coronavirus wasn't there for five, six months ago, and we may not be there. Hopefully, a year from now. So uh, 
but, but you have to have the flexibility in your budget to respond to unpredictable developments, right? That's mm -hmm. the way. Mm -hmm. Your institute, Miriam Institute, has probably one year budget, right? And your university has one budget. Most organizations are only two states on earth which, has, which have two year budget, two mm -hmm. years budget only. I think this was an Israeli invention, okay, <laughs> like many others. But now he's preaching just the opposite. He's preaching our own Torah. He says, yes, few months is enough because I don't know what happened, what will happen next year. I cannot predict uh, any development. So I, I need that budget only for the rest of the year. And then we'll see what to do next year. Gan says, no, sir, you are committed to two year budget and that's gonna be the case. What is going, what's hiding yes. behind? You want yes. to know because politics is not what you say, is what you mean. And you right. usually don't say what you mean and you don't, and, and you mean, and what you mean, you don't say. That's, the, that's a top secret, but I've just disclosed it to you and to other participants. That's, that's the way it is. So what does it, what does it mean? Netanyahu is looking for a way how to break the partnership, the political partnership between blue and white and Likud. He again dreams about right wing or right uh, wing uh, coalition to have a majority. He didn't have, he couldn't have a majority without uh, a Victor Lieberman party, but the dream is still there. For a while, he ran very high in the polls. He had like 40 um, seats in the Knesset which would have given him a majority, but he went down since then to around 30. Okay, it may change in the future, but if he is able to form, we have to go through another election campaign, which is a disaster, disaster at this time, when one million Israelis are unemployed, 20% of the people, one million Israelis are unemployed to run, to get the country again, into election campaign, which will cost hundreds of not, of not billions of, of shekels, which we don't have anywhere for nothing. And I, I don't know what will be the outcome, but it may save him politically and personally. In a new coalition, he may pass certain legislation. There are some ideas that will release him or relieve him from his upcoming trial, okay? So it took him a while. He first built the coalition, and then he asked himself, wow, maybe I can do something different and save myself and see what will happen. But he doesn't have the, the majority in the Knesset yet for this. If they don't reach an agreement between, them, the, between the Likud and, and, and Blue and White, until the August 25th, that's the deadline. It's right. very, very soon. If there's no compromise, and if there's no budget, according to the Israeli law, new elections are being called within six months. So next March, we'll have another elections, as if we didn't have enough in the past year and a half. So that may be the ramifications, a new election campaign, a new round of election in Israel. I feel that there'll be a compromise. I, I think so. I mean, that's the... I think there will be a compromise. Yes. Yeah, I, 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 it, it's hard to think about Israel. It's, it, it sounds ridiculous, uh, unacceptable, you know, election suddenly again, and what for? But you never know. Sometimes, well, sometimes politicians lose their minds and, 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 and the rationale beyond that and they vote to disperse the Knesset and, and you have elections. So wait and see. I feel they'll, they'll reach an agreement somehow because wisdom should prevail, not only for the, with all the respect to the benefit of the politicians, but the rest of the people living in Israel, which is like 9 million people, and they deserve to have a stable government. And especially they deserve, first of all, to see the Israeli economy being recovered. That's the most important idea. And by the way, when this government was formed, the major motivation 
the mm. major excuse for breaking po political parties and breaking the lines between one right and wing was that we are in deep in this, Israel is sinking into deep into this cri economic crisis and we need a national unity government. So yes. the need is still there. Mm -hmm. the, 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 there's another spike in, in, in coronavirus in Israel, go up and down like here, uh, but it's there. So the, the major reason still exists very as, as strong as it was a few months ago. So Nachman, let me, let me ask you in the few minutes that we have left, I'm, I'm going to try and get through three questions with you. The first question is, this coalition, it was an emergency coalition. It was, it was termed that. Some people spoke about it as an emergency government, some people as a temporary government, some people as a unity government. But it was, the, the overarching idea was that Gantz was doing something even at the cost of his own political and, and popular position for the good of the country, and that was to step in and deal with this coronavirus. What is preventing an effective response to coronavirus? Why can this coalition not seem to get itself around this and wrap its arms around this crisis? Is it the personalities? Is it politicians arguing why, with one another? Why, is it Netanyahu's no, consideration? I'm trying to ask you, no, no, I can, I can try to, answer, to ask you a counter question. Please. What about the United States? Why the United States is unable, un, unable to find a, a consensus around the issue of coronavirus? So it's, it looks like it's easier in Israel because the, in Israel, the government understands there is a coronavirus. With President Trump, I'm not sure uh, that he gets it. Uh, they do. Why it doesn't work? It doesn't work for many reasons, but the major one is that the Israelis lost confidence. They don't trust the political echelon or the political parties or the political system any longer. The confidence, the, the rate of the, of, uh, of the trust of the people in the, in the politicians is very low, very low, and it went even further down. There were many reasons for that, but uh, at the beginning, for the, in, the, in the first round, people really did whatever they were asked to do. They were forced to do by, by the government. But in the second round, they, are, they have now many questions. Uh, they feel like they were misled by the government, uh, that it was just an excuse, uh, maybe to run away from, from, from the trial, maybe to lead Israel to um, long the wrong directions. Uh, and they disobey the government. Like over the weekend, Shabbat, yes, Israelis open stores against the, the government order. I mean, there are certain areas that you can usually usually use to open stores, uh, can, can, can you, uh, malls in Israel, and so on. They disobeyed. This civilian disobeyed, and something new for for Israelis usually, well, they feel like they have to follow the government uh, guide, guidelines or instructions. Uh, this is this is the core of, of the issue right now, and it troubles me not only because of the coronavirus. It troubles me that people will lose face with democracy, with the democratic mm. institutes of Israel, with the democratic system. They say it didn't help us; it failed. Let's look for another political system. This, that may develop into a big tragedy. It's not happening yet. But there are voices saying maybe the Knesset is incompetent. Maybe the politicians are, well, let's do something else that can save the country. Uh, I, I feel like that this is, this is, this is a, a tragic development and a tragic moment in our history if people suddenly develop dreams about different political systems. So we have to strengthen the democratic institutes, which we, the Knesset, the Supreme Court, and the government, and to let them do the job in a way that it will be balanced. There is certain balance between all those uh, government branches. Uh, this is what we are dealing with. Until not long time ago, the Supreme Court was under fire by the government. Uh, you, we all remember that, but it went down a little bit, but it's still there very, very much. Uh, so that's, that's an historic moment in Israel history right now. 
And it's uh, mainly motivated, as I said before, by the economic powers, by the, by the unemployment and by the disappointment of people. That don't. So why doesn't work? Too many government ministers, 36 government ministers, people ask themselves, why should I pay for an extra 20 government ministers or 15 government ministers, which were, I mean, the other, the outgoing government had much less. Now, what, what's going on here? And a huge number of deputy government ministers, a huge government in a time that we have to save and to cut our expenditures. And they themselves, they, they argue between themselves, they disagree mm -hmm. with each other. So we got the feeling there is lack of leadership. There's no clear message coming from the government what to do. Israelis will do if they feel like the message is clear and the message is mainly and only based on the public interest, not on any one personal interest. That's what people would like to see. If they get it, they'll do whatever they need. If not, it's a total chaos. My last two questions for you, Nachman. You spoke about the idea of uh, Netanyahu's ambitions for a right-wing government again. Yes. And one of the people who seems to be the beneficiary of Gantz's lack of experience or the ineptitude of Gantz, or however you wish to call it, or perhaps the manipulation of others within the coalition, is Naftali Bennett. Naftali Bennett's star seems to be rising. Now, it's risen before, and it's plummeted, and it's now on the rise again. If Netanyahu allows for the situation or, or brings about a situation where a budget is not passed and that brings about the end of this particular coalition, his natural partner for the forming of a governing right-wing coalition would be Naftali Bennett. But these two do not get on, do not work well. It, do you think that Netanyahu's aversion towards Naftali Bennett might be enough to have him reach a compromise on the budgetary issue with Gantz just to avoid having to bring uh, Bennett into the coalition? Or do you think that there's another combination that Netanyahu is looking for in order to bring about that right-wing government that you spoke about? Uh, I was not a bit good in mathematics uh, <laughs> uh, in school. Uh, if you, <laughs> so even with <laughs> Natalie Bennett, he doesn't have 61. He needs uh, Victor Lieberman. That's the only right-wing party which currently is, well, the two of them now are in the opposition. Right. But Ali Bennett, he could have brought in. He can, he can bring him in immediately if he offers him the defense ministry again. Naftali mm -hmm. Bennett will run all the way from Ra'anana to <laughs> Jerusalem. He will jog all the way. He's very young and relatively young and capable guy. And he was a member of, he was in Sayeret Matkal. So he's fine, in good shape. Uh, so the defense ministry is a huge temptation for him. But Victor Lieberman uh, has made it clear as many times as he can, he's not going to vote or support any coalition by Netanyahu. And without Lieberman, the under 60, if a new, new election are being held, maybe something will change. Maybe. It's a huge risk, but maybe. Bennett and Netanyahu uh, can serve together in the same government, but the hatred, the aversion, if you right. see, between themselves, it's not only Netanyahu, it's the, it's the family as well. It's the Netanyahu's family. That's something else. It has to do with things that I honestly don't even know. Why is it right. so? With him and another politician, a lady by the name of Yelet Shaked, both of them are the leaders of them. And by the way, another word, Net Bennett has a tradition. He's doing very well in all the polls between the elections. But when it comes to the election themselves, he's doing poorly. Right. So, yes, he's doing. So now he may, uh, may have 15 or whatever, but this is just in the, in the sky. When he comes down to ground, I'm not sure he will have that many mandates. So he's not there yet. In the time, one day after Netanyahu's um, generation, I would say, mm -hmm. Bennett probably will join the Likud and will be one of the leaders of, of the Likud. That's, what, that's what, as far as I can see, because he is, uh, actually, he, he, he doesn't belong to the uh, orthodox um, uh, portion or, or community of the state of Israel. He's not there. He's much more to 
the, to the center, to the center right. And he also, he wears a kippah, but he's not very orthodox. He's a kind of a liberal, of a soft um, re religious, you know, modern, auto, what you call modern orthodox. It's a different kind of thing. And he disagrees with the, with the extreme right wing. Mm -hmm. so, so I guess in the future, I don't know when, it may take some time, but he will move back, kind of moving back to the Likud and be one of their leaders. That's, that's my focus. Yeah, I, I agree with that very much. I, I've always felt that, that Bennett and Shaked really are Likudniks who belong in the Likud. And if, if Net the day after Netanyahu, they'll simply fold yeah, in. And as everything long as Netanyahu is there, there uh, they would not get anything from him any longer. So my, my last question, we see Professor Gamzu now has taken over, but an interesting aspect of it that I, I just wanted you to weigh in on, it's all, the, the handling of the coronavirus has now been handed squarely back to the defense establishment. Mm. Now, now, there are ministries in the states of Israel that are supposed to deal with different sectors, different crises, different opportunities. You've got the transportation ministry, that's for transport. You've got the defense ministry, that's for defense. And then you've got the health ministry. And that ministry seems completely, totally and utterly ill-equipped to deal with this situation. By the way, it's not the only ministry that, that seems to be in, in real struggle at the moment. The foreign ministry for years has been gutted and, and eaten away at and so forth. Are we overly militarized? The fact that every crisis has to be folded into the defense establishment in order to be resolved, is, is that going to serve as a warning to ready our ministries? Or will we continue to be dependent upon the defense establishment because it's so inbred within us in the state of Israel as, as Israelis? It's a very good question, if I can compliment you. Because you touched a, a, a basic issue in our life. Uh, the role of the military, which is much wider and, and bigger than just military affairs. Uh, actually, the army or the military were waiting on, on the sidelines to be called in. The reason is that they are much capable than any other civilian uh, machinery or apparatus. Uh, they can work 24 seven hours. I mean, 24-7, they have the education, they, 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 they've been prepared for emergency. They have the machinery, they have, the, they have the, the troops, the soldiers, young people. You have to run certain um, um, machine, machine here. Uh, that, just, uh, you know, the, those are uh, running the epidemiological uh, process that asking thousands of people where they were, what they do, wh whom they meet, they met, and so on. I mean, th that's something that can be done, uh, but you need thousands of people for that to ask the question, not to respond to the question. It's only about the military. They have the organization, they know how to run big operations like that. Unfortunately, as you rightly mentioned, the Ministry of for health, they have professionals, but they don't have the, the apparatus for that. Uh, I, and, 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 and the, the, the best thing Gamzo did when he was appointed to uh, be in charge of the, the coronavirus was to turn to the military, to turn to guns. And Gun said, okay, the, the home front command, which was established after the, the, the first Gulf War, which, which I served as a kind of, uh, uh, of a national spokesperson, uh, uh, the idea was that in crises like that, earthquake, flood, uh, pandemic, the army will be, will be called in. Netanyahu didn't want to at the beginning. He said, we can do it, I can do it, the health ministry can do it. He realized he can. So he has all the means, the human resources to run the show, literally. It, does, it's, it doesn't have to be a show, it can be in the shadow, but, but, but in, in principle, they are the major um, uh, uh, organization within Israel with the cap capacity to um, lead Israel through this crisis. So I'm glad 
the decision was finally made and, and Netanyahu accepted it. He agreed that the army will take much more uh, active role in running the anti-pandemic campaign here. I don't like to call it a war. The question is, I mean, you have a home front command, that's the role. Other Israeli uh, troops and, and commanders will be dealing with Hezbollah, Syria, Iran. There's no shortage of uh, Hamas, Judea and Samaria, there are enough threats on Israel. They are still there. But the home, home, home front command, it's, this is their role, and I'm sure they'll do it as much as the best, as much as they can. At the same time, if the government ministers are not going to help and to let Gamzo to uh, lead the Israeli campaign against the coronavirus, he will fail, we will fail. I had an article yesterday in Aretz saying, let Gamzo win. And that's like, let Sahal win. Okay. Let the IDF win. Let the IDF win. Yeah, yeah. And the, the title was, and they used my, my headline. They said, yes, let Gamzo win for us, I said. Not for, eh, well, he may also win for himself, but that's a different issue. For us. But if the government ministers, even the prime minister, are not going to help him and to let him do his job professionally, he will fail, we will fail. And only God maybe will save us. Only. If he's around, he will save us, hopefully. But other, uh, otherwise, I don't see any other solution. Gamzo knows what to do. The question is whether they will let him do it. And that's a crucial question when it comes to Israel, as we have just discussed for almost an hour. Well, thank you so much, Nachman. I really appreciate having you on here. There's a lot more that I could talk about with you, but I, I know that the time is up. And I, I want to thank again, Rosita. I want to thank Alan and also Thomas. Special thanks to Thomas for, for stepping in here and running this webinar. Nachman, thank you so very much. You continue to educate me. The best of luck at Slacha with your, your you. teaching in, in Duke uh, and beyond. And I hope that you'll come back and uh, and as we always say, Gamzu uh, Letova, uh, this also is, is for the best. So we wish, of course, Gamzu uh, every possible success as he steps into the breach to battle back against coronavirus. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for listening. And I look forward to the next time. We I'd like to be. thank you and everyone and to the Miriam Institute and Rosita. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Nachman. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.